How many of you guys are ready to meet with God today? Well, we're so grateful that you're here. My name is Andrew Carroll. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life Community Church. Our senior pastors, Pastor Steve and Pastor Tammy, and a, a few of uh, our staff, a few of our team, they're at a training conference this week. So I have the wonderful privilege of opening God's Word up with you today. And I'm excited for today because today we're going to be talking about God's house. Somebody say God's house. This is the one about God's house. So if you're wondering what this message is about, this is the one about God's house. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Yes. Pull out your Bibles. Raise them up. Let's see them. Let's make sure we still bring our Bibles to church. All right. Today, we're going to give your fingers uh, some movement today. We're going to look at three different passages. So if you want to look ahead, you can look ahead and put a pen or a bookmark or a flyer in there. But we're going to look at Exodus chapter 40. We're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 8. And we're going to look at Acts chapters 1 and 2. That's Exodus 40, 1 Kings 8, and Acts chapters 1 and 2. And as we begin today, I want to begin with a question. And my question is, what comes to mind when you think of home? When you think of home, are, are there images or, or things that come to mind? Some of you may, may have, a, a, have had a bad experience growing up. Others of you may have had a good experience. But when you think of the word home, what comes to mind? You know, one thing that comes to my mind is the house that I grew up in. In fact, I went on Google this week and I, I got a shot of the house that I grew up in. I lived in this house for 18 years and... Uh, but our family moved out about 17 years ago. And when I looked at it, I'm like, I was reminded that my mom made me cut that lawn every week. And, and Ed and all those memories started coming back. But it's been 17 years since we've lived there. But I lived in that house for 18 years. How many of you grew up in, in the same house? Okay. How many of you, during your childhood, you moved from house to house, right? That was my wife's experience. She moved 11 times before she was 14. So when we were getting to know each other, she was talking about what it was like to move from one place to another. I said, I said, sweetheart, I totally get you. OK, I was in one room and then I moved to the next room right down the hall. And then when my brothers moved out, I moved from the downstairs to the upstairs and all that adjusting and so forth. But but I you know, when I think of home, that that house comes to mind. But for some of you, it may not be a, a, a place that comes to mind. It might be people. You know, I, I think of my grandmother. I, I grew up in the same city as my grandmother. And my grandmother lived in different places. She, she lived in an apartment. She lived in a mobile home. She lived in a house. She lived in an assisted uh, living home. But wherever grandma went, grandma's house was grandma's house, right? When you walked in, man, grandma was welcoming. Grandma always had some, some snacks or some food on the table. And the older that grandma got, the more you had to be careful with the type of snacks that she would lay out on the table. Like, grandma, this cheese has been here a, a long time. But, but thank you, grandma, right? We, but that was, grandma, that was grandma's heart, right? Everybody's welcome. Everyone's invited. She was one of the most hospitable, generous people uh, that I knew. Um, but also one of the things that comes to mind when we think about home is how many of you would agree that each house, each home, each family has a certain way of doing things, right? And, and so you grow up learning like this is how our family's going to do things. In fact, if we, you were to go to lunch with our family today, one thing that you would notice is that when we were out and the waiter or waitress brings the, the straws, we take the straw, we rip off a part of the straw, and then we try to blow the end of the straw at somebody. We do that. It's great. We love it. And it, what was awesome was when Eden was getting older, her aim, her aim has gotten better. But there's been times where it's shot right past us to the table across, immediately heads down. We're just like, you know. But we love to have fun, right? That, that's, that's how we roll in our house, right? And, and here's my point in all of this. That our home, our house, is a reflection of our heart. To some degree, our home and the way our house runs is a reflection of our heart. Now, I want to share with you a part of my testimony that, that I haven't shared before. And not too many people know, but I was a drug baby. I was drugged to church Sunday morning. I was drugged to church Sunday night. I was drugged to church Wednesday night. I was drugged to church on Friday all my life. 
from the time I was little. My parents, they, they took me to church, right? And, and I have noticed this from, from having church be a part of my life for the majority of my life. I've noticed this, that there are times that people can be in the house of God and yet they can miss the heart of God. That it is possible for you and I to be in this place, to be in the house of God, and we can miss the heart of God that's right in front of us. I believe this. I believe that the biggest need in our society, in our culture, the, the biggest longing that we have in what it means to be human is that we have a need to be in the house of God. But even more than that, we have a need to be close to the heart of God. So what we're going to do today is this. We know that in the story of the Bible, that in the beginning, heaven and earth were one. That, that, that heaven and earth, that God and humanity, they shared the same space. And the promise is in Revelation that at the end, heaven and earth will become one again. But the question is, where is God in the middle? You see, God made a promise. The promise that the Lord made was, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What type of God makes that promise? And how does God intend to keep that promise? So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the story of the Bible. And we're going to look at the three houses, the three spaces where God dwells. And as we look at those spaces, you and I are going to get a glimpse of the heart of God. And then the question will become is what type of heart will we have? Will we share the heart of God? So are you guys ready to get started today? You guys got your notes in hands? All right. The first space we see God's presence dwelling is number one, the tabernacle. Everybody say tabernacle. So number one, the tabernacle. And it is in this space that we realize that God is willing to walk with his people. God is willing to walk with us. Now in Exodus chapter 40, Verses 34 through 38, this is what the word of the Lord says. It says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This is amazing because this is the first time since the Garden of Eden where heaven and earth shared the same space. This was the first time when, when, in a world that was broken, in a world that was lost, you could look and in that space, in that tabernacle, Heaven and earth met together. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And so, verse 35, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day that it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day. And fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all of Israel during all of their travels. During all of their travels. A few observations here. Observation number one. When they built the tabernacle, the way that the tabernacle was designed, down to the colors that filled that space, it was supposed to be a reminder of the Garden of Eden. That, that it would be, in a sense, a portable version of the Garden of Eden. That God is dwelling with his people once again. Another observation is that, that God dwelt in this temple. And here's a picture of it. And on that picture, you'll notice that around the tabernacle were all the other tents. Okay, What this shows is that God dwelled right in the middle of his people. Right in the center of Israel was the tabernacle. It served as a sign. It served as a, a point which heaven and earth met together. But here's the thing that made the tabernacle unique. It was mobile. Right? God was willing to camp. Right? God was willing to bring his tent down. And he was willing to travel with his people. He, the cloud would go. They would go. And he would rest, and he traveled with them day after day after day. All right, I got a pop quiz question for you, right? We're going to see how well all of you listened in Sunday school. Can anybody tell me how long it took for the people of Israel to go from the, the wilderness to the promised land? 
40 years. That's a long camping trip. That's a long camping trip. How many of you love camping? How many of you like, I can give an afternoon, right? But I want a nice bed and a nice shower. It makes the experience a lot, lot better, right? And what's interesting is that trip should have took 11 days. But it took 40 years because the hearts of the people were stubborn and unbelief, right? But here's the point, that God was willing to walk with his people. Can I tell you this? God is willing to walk with you. He's willing to walk with you. I want you to think about your life. Think about the situations that you've brought. Think about this last month, this last week, or even this last year. Think about the high points of your life. Think about the low points of your life. Think about the, the trials and the difficulties in relationships. Think about the things that fill your mind that nobody else knows. God knows because he's walked with you through all of it. A few weeks ago, we talked about that life is full of seasons. There's times to weep and there's times to laugh. There's times to mourn and there's time to dance. And listen, when we walk through life, not all of it is good, right? We walk through times in our life. But even in the seasons where we don't see God, God is walking with us. Here's the beautiful thing about the Lord when he traveled with the people of Israel every day. Listen to this, every day. Somebody say every day. Every day the Lord provided bread for his people. Every day. Now, he, God wasn't into meal planning, right? He wasn't into like, okay, here's your bread for the week. Although on the sixth day he said, here's your bread for today and the Sabbath tomorrow. But God gave them bread every day. Why? Because God wanted to remind them every day that he is still with them, still walking with them, and that he was never going to leave them or forsake them. So God's house, the tabernacle, shows us a window into God's heart, that God's heart is he is willing to walk with his people. And here's my question for you. Are you willing to walk with God? Some of us are willing to walk with God two Sundays out of the month, right? But we want to keep the weekdays, and especially Saturdays, and one or two Sundays to ourselves, right? Yeah. Right? But God is inviting you and I to walk with him and to walk with him daily. Some people, when life is good, they're walking with God, right? When things go our way, oh, it's easy to walk with the Lord. But when things in our life happen the way that we don't want them to, sometimes people turn away from God and they run to other things. And for other people, it's the opposite. Sometimes they run to God when things are bad, but as soon as their life calms down, they figure, what's the need for the Lord anymore? But God is inviting us to walk with him. So the tabernacle was mobile. It went with the people. But when the people entered into the promised land and they were there in that permanent place, Solomon wanted to build a permanent place for the Lord. And that moves us to our second house. So as you're taking notes, our second house is the temple. And in the temple, we see this. That God is willing to forgive us. That God is willing to forgive us. How many of you are grateful that God is willing to forgive us? Come on. Has anybody in this room ever been forgiven of something? How many of you are grateful that we can go to the Lord and the Lord removes our sin from us? How many of you are grateful that you're not who you used to be? Can we praise God for that? So they, they built this temple. In fact, here's a picture of Solomon's temple. And they had the outer courts. And then they had the inner courts. And then that building in the center, within it was the holy place and the holy of holies. And inside the holy of holies, the presence of God dwelt. Listen, the same way that God filled the tabernacle is the same way that the presence of God filled his temple. So on the day of dedication, they built this temple and Solomon stood before the assembly of Israel. And there's this beautiful prayer that Solomon prays. But what's interesting is that in this prayer, there is a, a, an invitation that's given out. He's inviting people to come to the house of God and to meet with the Lord. But it's interesting who this invitation is to. In 1 Kings chapter 8, I want you to follow along. 1 Kings chapter 8, we're going to look at the invitation through Solomon's prayer. And in verse 31, 
It's an invitation to anybody who's going through a dispute or a disagreement. Before we read, is there anybody in the room that you are at odds with somebody? Is there anybody in this room that in one relationship in your life that there's a disagreement, there is a dispute? Is there anybody in this room where somebody has, has hurt you or committed an injustice against you? If that's you, lean in a little closer, hear the words of the Lord. First Kings chapter eight, the invitation goes out. When anyone wrongs their neighbor and is required to take an oath and they come and they swear the oath before the altar in the temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing down on their heads what they have done and vindicating the innocent by treating them in accordance with their innocence. So Solomon gives this invitation, who's ever in dispute, come to the house of the Lord. Why? This is what we learn. When we have been wronged, God can make it right. When we've been wronged, God can make it right. How many know that when people wrong us, when they hurt us, when they give us this injustice, we have a choice what to do with it? For some people, we take this injustice and we bury it down. Well, what happens when we bury it? It becomes resentment. It becomes bitterness. Some people take this injustice and they throw it back. Well, that's vengeance. Some people take this injustice and they pass it forward. What's that? That's just stupidity, right? Because any pain that we don't process, we pass on. But what is God inviting us to do? What's the invitation here? God is saying, hey, listen, if somebody has committed an injustice against you, where do you go? You go to the house of the Lord. Why? Because when we have been wronged, God can make it right. How does God do this? He does it in his way. He does it in his time. If we put it in his hands. Amen. But there's a second invitation that goes out in verse 33. It says, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and they give praise to your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land who you gave your ancestors. Does anybody in the room today feel defeated by life? Does anybody in the room today feel defeated by the circumstances? Do you feel beat down by the enemies in your life? I'm here to tell you today that even though that there are times that we feel beat down by life, that God reaches down and he lifts us up because the Bible says that he is the lifter of our head. That we are victorious. I'm here to tell you today, somebody in here needs to hear this. You are not a victim. Jesus is the lifter of your head. Look to him. So when we feel defeated by life, where do we run? We run to the house of the Lord. We run to meet with God because he lifts us up. But ladies and gentlemen, the prayer's not over. The prayer's not over, verse 35. When the heavens are shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and give praise to your name and turn, from their sin because you have afflicted them. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land that you gave your people for their inheritance. Is there anybody in this room that you feel like you've been in a drought spiritually, that, that your life is dried up, that the life and the vibrancy and, the, and that, that feeling of excitement, it has just dried up? The people of Israel received a blessing from God, which was the land. But when they, once they received the blessing, what did they do? They turned away from the Lord. And what does that teach us? Here it is. That the blessing is not the gift. The blessing is the giver. May we be a people who seek God because of who he is and not because of what he can give us. May we be a people who run to the Lord. And when we find ourselves in seasons of drought, in seasons where we feel spiritually dry, where do we go? Where do we go? We run to the house of the Lord. Why? Because when we turn from God, God can hear from heaven and he can heal us. But the prayer's not over. The prayer's not over. 
Verse 37, when famine or plague comes to the land, and blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster, somebody say disaster. Whatever disease, somebody say disease. Whatever may come, when a prayer or a plea is made by anyone among your people Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts, and spreading out their hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, forgive and act and deal with everyone according to all that they do, since you know their hearts. For you alone know every human heart, so that they will fear you all the time they live in the land you gave our ancestors. What's the Lord saying? Hey, whenever there's a disease that comes from within, or disaster that comes from without. Where do we do? Where do we go? We run to the house of the Lord. We run to meet with God. Because when we turn to God, listen, this is what God does. The God who knows every human heart can quiet the heart and calm the storm with just a whisper. I wonder how many people in this room, you've come into this place and your heart is full. Maybe you're experiencing a disease within, or maybe the circumstances of life are just disasters upon disasters. Where do we run to? We run to the house of the Lord. We run to meet with God. But the prayer's not over. The prayer's not over. 41. As the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and they pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name. Isn't that the heart of God? That all the peoples of the earth would know his name, and that they would fear you, as do your own people Israel. And may you know that this house I have built bears your name. What's he saying? Hey, any foreigner, foreigners were those that were disconnected those that didn't belong to the people of God. I wonder if there's anybody in the room today who feels disconnected. I wonder if there's anybody in here today who feels like you don't belong. Isn't it amazing, listen to this, isn't it amazing that we can be surrounded by people and yet we can feel utterly alone. So what do we do? What do we do when we feel alone? What do we do when we feel disconnected? I'll tell you what we do. We run to the house of the Lord. We run to meet with God. Why? Because God loves the lost and he looks for the lonely and his heart is to seek and save those that are lost. Oh, that the heart of God would open up his hand and sweep us in. God desires nobody to feel lost, alone, or disconnected. So we can come to the house of the Lord, but the prayer's not over. Verse 44, and when your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city that you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven and their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. At the beginning of the prayer, he said when, Pete, when the, Israel was defeated by their enemies, but now in the prayer, is that when the people of Israel will go out and defeat their enemies. I wonder if today there's somebody in the room that there are some enemies in your life, that there are some things that you have to conquer, that you have to overcome to be who God has called you to be. I wonder if there's anybody here today that has ever felt that things are not going to change for you. I'm here to tell you today that when you don't know what to do, when you have no strength left, what do you do? You run to the house of the Lord and you turn to God. Because the battle is the Lord's. I believe, I believe somebody in here needs to hear that today. The, the battle is the Lord's. But the prayer's not over. The prayer's not over. Look at this. I turn the page. Amen. Look at this, verse 46. And when they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin. Turn to your neighbor and say he's talking about you. Right? It's talking about all of us, right? There's nobody that does not sin. And when you become angry with them and you give them over to their enemies, who take them captive to their own lands, far away or near, and if they have a change of heart 
in the land where they are held captive, and then they repent, and they plead with you in the land of their captors, and they say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, and we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all of their heart and all of their soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive, and they pray toward the, uh, toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city that you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, verse 49, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer, hear their plea, uphold their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all of the offenses that they have committed against you and cause their captors to show them mercy. For they are your people and they are your inheritance whom you've brought out of Egypt. This is amazing. Because what is Solomon saying? Hey, listen, Solomon is saying all of us in this room, there are times in our lives when we are disobedient to God, where we are runners, and we run away from the Lord. And Solomon is saying, hey, listen, if you found yourself running away from the Lord, come on back, come on back, come on back. I wonder today if there's anybody in this room that you've been living with disobedience in your life, that if you're honest with yourself, you're here in church, but you've got your running shoes on and you have been running from what God has been wanting you to do. Today is the day to turn that around. This week, we got together as a church on First Wednesday and in the morning, as our time of prayer and fasting, there was a young man who prayed this prayer. He said, dear God, may those that run from God become seekers of God. And it is our prayer, this invitation, is that all of us who have our running shoes on and we've been running away from the Lord, that rather than running away from the Lord, that we would run to God, that we would run to his house, that we would meet with the Lord. Because he desires to forgive us. This prayer, is, it's absolutely amazing because it shows us how God wants his house to be ran. God doesn't want the things that are broken to stay broken. He doesn't want that. God is willing to forgive us. I wanna show you a picture, a picture of a jersey with a number and a very important word. And I wanna tell you a story about this picture. On Wednesday night at our first Wednesday service, I was talking with a few guys and there was this one guy there and he said this. He said, my life has completely changed in the last year. <laughs> He's like, my marriage has changed. Like, my relationship with my kids has changed. He's like, I'm doing things that I never thought I would do. He was like, I'm serving in a ministry, right? I'm a part of a life group. He was like, Pastor Andrew, I read a book that is going to help me become a better husband. He's like, I was not the type of guy that would read a book on how to be a better husband, right? That over this year, his whole life completely changed. And he said, to be honest with you, I only came to church to stop my wife from asking me. I wonder how many people have come to church today and you're here just to allow the person next to you to stop asking you to come. Well, he came. So what was interesting was when he came a year earlier, there was sin in his life. There were things in his life that were not right. He was rebelling against the Lord. He decided to define for himself what was good and what was evil. And as a result, it was destroying his marriage. And when he got into the presence of God, he felt the weight of his rebellion against the Lord. And he went down on his knees. And God just, just started dealing with his heart. And literally, when he opened his eyes, he saw another brother wearing that jersey that said forgiven. And in that moment, he heard the Holy Spirit tell him, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. So we're standing there talking and he's like, dude, that's, that's the shirt. So I literally, I went up and I took that picture on Wednesday. I'm like, I gotta take a picture of the shirt. And then I started talking to the guy who wore the shirt. And the reason why he, he has the number 17 is because he was in prison 17 years. And that while he was in prison, he received the forgiveness of God. I wonder if anybody came today and you need to know that if you lay your sins at the cross, God will forgive you. But Pastor Andrew, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. My friend, you don't know what he's done. If you believe 
that your sin is so great that God can't forgive you, what you're telling me is that you don't think the sacrifice of Jesus was enough to pay for your sins and to pay for mine. So God is willing to forgive you. He's willing to remove your sins. Now here's the question. Are we willing to forgive others? Are we willing to have that heart? You know, there's a verse in the Bible that that says, if you don't forgive others, your heavenly father won't forgive you. Now, now God's not saying, well, if you're not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. Like, that's not the heart of God, right? What those verses are showing us is that they're, they're giving us a window into the very nature of forgiveness. It, that, that on this forgiveness, there's a hinge. And when we open the door of forgiveness, to the door of our heart to receive the forgiveness of the Lord, at the same time, the door is opening of our heart to extend forgiveness toward others. But sometimes forgiveness is a process. How many of you know somebody in your life that might be a little bit older in years and they have this big bag and in this bag they have all these bottles and inside these bottles there's these different pills and and then they have this little thing that says Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and they take all these pills and they put them in. How many of you know somebody who takes a lot of medication, right? And uh, I like to think of forgiveness like medication. Here's why. Because oftentimes forgiveness doesn't happen with, oh, just one pill, I'm good, right? Usually when we take medicine, we have to take more than one, right? The prescription is take daily. Or maybe the prescription is take three times a day. Maybe you need to remind yourself three times, Lord, I want to forgive this person, you've forgiven me. And then at lunch, Lord, I want to forgive this person, you've forgiven me. And Lord, at dinner, I forgive this person, you've forgiven me, right? And then you work out your prescription. And how many of you know sometimes when you get to the end of the prescription, you got to go to the pharmacy and get a whole new thing, right? <laughs> What's my point? My point is that forgiveness is a process. So if we can leave the room here and not want to kill the person, <laughs> let's celebrate, right? The Lord is moving, right? Why? Because as we forgive, as we take that medicine, what does it do? It heals us from the sickness and it allows us to live a life as we were intended to live. When we are sick with unforgiveness, it cripples us and it robs us from living the life that God wants us to live. And God doesn't want us to live that way. So God moves into his second house, right? And it was permanent. But here's what happened. The people of Israel, they didn't want anything to do with the Lord. And because of their rebellion, rebellion, ignoring the warnings of God, in Ezekiel chapter 10, there's a vision. And the vision is of the glory of the Lord rising up from the temple and leaving. And then in 586 BC, the armies of Babylon come in and they destroy the temple. They destroy the city. The devastate. Can you imagine? Like, like, do we have any point of reference that the symbol, that the place, that the only hope of where heaven and earth met is now in pieces. But God promised that he would never leave us, that he would never forsake us. So after the people got back from exile like 70 years, guess what? They came back and they rebuilt the temple. But when they rebuilt the temple, there's never a story of God filling the temple again until we get to the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter one, verse eight. Acts chapter one, verse eight. We're gonna look at Acts chapter one, and we're gonna look at chapter two, verses one through four. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Chapter two. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Now we go to the third house. What's the third house? The third house is the church. And what does the church show us about the heart of God? that God is willing to send us. 
God is willing to send us. Now this is interesting. The tabernacle was mobile. The temple was permanent. But the church is both permanent and mobile. We, as the people of God, because of God's forgiveness upon our lives, we are now carriers of God's presence. Do we, do we have any idea the gravity of what that means? That when we meet together, God is in that place. That when we meet in homes and in life groups and we sit around and, and people are sharing their lives, God is in that place. When we roll up our sleeves and we serve alongside of others and we go out into the city, God is in that place. And he says in Acts 1a that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But why? Why? So that you will be my witnesses. Listen, New Life Community Church, we need to value coming to church, but we also need to understand our vocation and our calling to be the church. We need to be the church. All of those reasons that we talked about earlier, right? Uh, disputes and defeats and droughts and disasters and disease and being disconnected and destroying our enemies and disobedience. All the reasons why people came to church are now all the reasons why we as a church need to go to the people. And we here at New Life, we believe this. Listen, this week we're going. This week we're sending 14 people to Haiti. We're partnering with another uh, uh, another church in Washington and another church in Haiti. So all three of our teams are going to a village in Haiti, in Leogon, to, to run a medical clinic and a VBS for children where we're gonna gather people together and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. But we all gotta be a part of that. Listen, you may not be one of the people that go, but all of us in this room can give toward that. We can give our prayers. And listen, we are still trying to collect some of the finances, finances to care for the, the backpacks and the supplies and, and the different costs involved. We all can be a part of that. Listen, this, oh, this is amazing. This is so amazing. This Saturday, this Saturday, in this place, in this room right here, nine church, nine church, say nine. Nine churches in this city are coming together. One city, one church. Listen, over 500 people have signed up and that's not including anybody from New Life. Yeah. The people of God are coming together. And what are we gonna do? We're gonna worship the Lord, but then we're gonna go out into the streets. We're gonna go out into the neighborhoods. We wanna be a part of that. God is willing to send us. Are you willing to go? Some of you, right after the service, what you need to do is you need to stand up, you need to go out to the lobby, and you need to sign up on one of those teams. We need to be a people that go. Listen, there is a world that is hurting, and we have the hope of God's word. How dare we not go? Because sometimes you're going to invite people and they're going to come to church. And when they come to church, they're going to meet Jesus. But there are other people that you know in your life that will never step foot inside this room. We need you to be the church. There are some people that you're gonna bring and they're gonna give their hearts to Jesus, but there are some people that you are gonna lead to Jesus in your dining room, that you're gonna lead to Jesus in your workplace. People, people, we've got to be the church. Do you hear me? We've got to go. We've got to be a church. There is a world that is lost. There is a world that is dying and we have the words of hope. We've got to be the church. We are the carriers of God's presence. This is how we're gonna end the service. We're gonna pray. Because we need God's help to carry his heart. To be willing to walk with God, to be willing to forgive others, and to be willing to go where God sends us. We can't do that on our own. We can't. Because here, here's, here's the thing. Although we're carriers of the promise and presence of God, we're also carriers of the problem. Like the world is messed up 
and we contribute to that. Every time we ignore the words of the Lord and we do things our own way. But that's the heart of God. That those of us who were part of the problem, he wants to forgive and redeem and walk. And now we get to be carriers of his presence. So I wanna pray. And then after I pray, we're gonna sing a song. If you wanna be a person who walks with God day in and day out, like God walks with us, I want you to stand up. If you wanna be a person who wants to forgive others the way that God has forgiven you, I want you to stand up. If you wanna be a person that is willing to go where God sends you because God wants to send you, I want you to stand up. We can't do it without the Lord. In fact, the prayer that I wanna pray as the worship team comes out, the prayer that I wanna pray is Solomon's prayer. When Solomon stood before the temple as he closed his prayer, he prayed this prayer and today I wanna pray this prayer over you. It says, praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he had promised. Not one word, not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us. May he never forsake us. And may he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, his decrees and his laws that he gave our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. May he uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, Israel, according to each day's need. God is gonna meet you daily to give you the ability to walk with him and to forgive like him and to go like him. Verse 60, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. God, that's our prayer, that everyone would know that you are the Lord. You have not forget, uh, forsaken us. You have not forgotten us, but you've forgiven us. You've redeemed us, Lord. And may our hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and to obey his commands as at this time. Father, I pray that we would be that type of people. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.